Okay. Over to you, Lou. Right. Okay. Let's um, give it a go. So um, I used to think that cast was, oops, hang on. Just sorting out my Zoom again. Right. Got there. Brilliant. So I used to think that cast was just about the Carboniferous limestone and the major caving areas like the Yorkshire Dales and the Mendips. And it was actually something of a surprise to find that cast is much more widespread. And this talk is going to be about the chalk and the Jurassic and Permian limestones, which were usually not considered karstic in the, in the past, but hopefully by the end of the talk, you'll be convinced that these are karst aquifers if you aren't already. Um, it's based on lots of years of work, and so there's lots of people to thank. And I really especially want to thank Pete Smart and Tim Atkinson and Andy Farrant, who I learned so much about cast from. And also um, with the NERC Knowledge Exchange Fellowship that Vicky mentioned, uh, I want to thank the huge number of people that contributed to that. Um, and I learned a lot about real world issues from people in the Environment Agency and water companies. So um, tonight I'm going to start with a brief introduction to cast and then show some of the evidence for cast in these aquifers and think about how cast varies and finally talk about some of the implications of cast for groundwater protection. So the word cast comes from a place in Slovenia called Kras and here um, there's a typical karst landscape with little surface drainage and lots of big caves and you can see this entrance here seems to be um, bigger than the church. And karst occurs in soluble rocks where the fractures in the subsurface are enlarged by dissolution to form networks of larger voids. And this dissolution results in a characteristic set of landforms in the surface and the subsurface as well. And so in karst areas, weakly acidic water enters the ground and over time pathways between the input points and the output points evolve and enlarge, enlarge and you get networks of conduits between stream sinks and springs. And this is a conceptual cross section through a karst cave system in the Mendips at Wookie Hole. And you can see the karst development between the stream sinks here and the springs, the outlet points down here. But there can also be karst development at depth and in the absence of stream sinks. And this occurs because of mixing dissolution. So on this graph, the curve shows how saturation varies with the amount of PCO2 in the water. So waters with lower PCO2 reach saturation more quickly. And this is the curve here. And here we've got two solutions, B and A, which are fully saturated. But when they mix, because they have different PCO2, the resulting solution then becomes undersaturated again at point C here. And so this enables further dissolution. A little bit on terminology. The word conduit is used a lot, usually to mean voids that have been enlarged by dissolution. And when conduits are big enough to get into, then they're usually termed caves. And you can see that the big range of scales that conduits occur on. On the left here, we've got a small conduit um, in the chalk, about 10 centimetres across. And on the right there, there is uh, water flowing out of a very big conduit. You can see the yellow van here for the scale. And we can perhaps also distinguish between fissures and conduits. I always think of conduits as linear features. There's a small one here observed in a borehole, which is about 15 centimetres high. And it sort of looks a little bit like a miniature cave and you can imagine it going on into the rock. Whereas fissures are solution in large fractures, which are more laterally extensive. So for example, when they're related to bedding planes, they can extend quite far down dip and along the strike. And there's probably sometimes something of a continuum between these different types of voids. So the conduits might be embedded within the fissures. And people often wrongly think that rapid flow requires caves, um, but it doesn't. 
So some tracer tests in Hampshire showed that water in the chalk travelled almost six kilometres just as rapidly as we see in classically karstic aquifers. And Mike Price showed that theoretically a single pipe of about 74 meters, centimetres in diameter or a smooth planar fissure of 4.5 millimetres aperture could account for these very rapid flows. So in reality, of course, the voids are not smooth and not planar, so they'll be considerably bigger than the 4.5 millimetres. But what it does show is that rapid flow can occur in networks of smaller conduits and fissures, so you don't need caves. Um, so inception horizons are an important cast concept. Um, so these are beds or lithologies which are especially susceptible to dissolution. So it, it might be um, a very low permeability layer, so the water is concentrated above it, or it might be that the lithology has a particular geochemistry which um, makes it more susceptible to dissolution. And inception horizons are really important both for um, conduits formed by mixing dissolution, but also conduits formed along stream sink to spring flow paths. And in cast aquifers, you therefore, we often get flow down dip and along strike. And cast aquifers are really complex. There are a, a, a lots of different kinds of voids. The biggest are the, the conduits and caves. And as we've already said, they have really variable um, diameters from just 10 centimeters to more than 100 meters. Um, and then we have the fissures, the, which are the solution in large fractures, which might have apertures of around one to 10 centimeters. Uh, and then there's the, the um, unmodified fracture network, which hasn't been enlarged by dissolution. And then the, the finally, um, the, the bedrock matrix itself can have porosity. So water and flow, water flow and pollutant transport is really complex in cast aquifers, and the water and pollutants can move between these different kinds of voids. Right, so um, this is a map showing cast in Britain, and it's much more extensive than the major caving areas in the Carboniferous Limestone, which we normally associate with cast. So you can see these here. This is the Yorkshire Dales, um, the Derbyshire, Carboniferous Limestone and the Mendip Hills, for example. Um, there's also quite a bit of gypsum and salt cast. So this is shown in orange and black on the map here. I'm not going to talk about those. Um, they don't make very good drinking water aquifers, so then they're, they're not the main focus um, today. These are some pictures of some classical Carboniferous Limestone cast. On the top right, that's a, a typical dry valley in Malham in Yorkshire. And on the left there is the spectacular shaft at Gaping Gill Pothole. And if you're not a caver and you don't fancy abseiling down the hole or crawling through small passages to get there, um, the cavers do run a winch meet. So um, if you're feeling brave, members of the public can be lowered down and see this amazing place and, and hopefully get hauled back up again afterwards as well. But I want to focus on the chalk and the Jurassic and Permian limestones, um, which are major water supply aquifers in England. They have very limited cave development, but they do have all the features of cast. I'm going to start with the chalk, which is the one that we've done the most work on. It was initially quite a surprise to me to find out that there are cast caves in the chalk. And this map um, shows the distribution of, of the cast caves that we know about. Um, the picture on the right is a cave near Reading in Berkshire, which is uh, not known as a classic caving area. Um, the picture is by Terry Reeve. And if you're interested in chalk caves, then there's an excellent article in Cave and Cast Science by Terry, um, documenting decades of cave exploration in the chalk, um, which is really good. I should say that um, chalk caves are short. Uh, most of them are only a few tens of metres at most, and, and most of them are dry, they're, they're fossil caves. There are a few with water flow, um, in particular a few caves that have been exposed beneath stream sinks. At most stream sinks in the chalk, the water sinks through sediment, like this example here. Um, but occasionally the chalk is exposed below the stream sinks and we see quite big cavities, well, big for the chalk anyway. 
There are also some karst caves which have been intercepted by adits or wells. Um, this is a cave in Kent and you can see a classic um, karstic keyhole shaped cave passage here. And some caves have been intercepted by quarrying. Uh, this is another picture from Terry Reeve. Um, and it's quite a short cave, but there were solution features on the wall, um, providing evidence of past water flow. And there have also been caves exposed by coastal erosion. Uh, this is Beachy Head Cave, which is actually the longest known cast cave in the chalk, um, just over 350 metres long. But it's certainly the case that in the chalk, most cast conduits are small. And that raises the question of why there are so few caves. And um, we think there are a few possible reasons for this. Um, one is that um, the chalk bedrock has particularly high matrix porosity. And this might mean that the water moves towards saturation more quickly. There's also a very high primary fracture density, so maybe this means that more fractures are enlarged to a smaller extent rather than a few enlarged a lot. And also perhaps the stream sinks might be quite transient because, because they're often developed on sediments which are easily eroded away. So perhaps the stream sinks um, don't stay in the same place for very long geological periods, and so this may also limit larger cave development. Uh, I'm going to talk a bit about recharge via cast, and this most commonly is associated with the Paleogene margin. Um, on the map here, the pink areas are the Paleogene and the green areas are the chalk, and the red circles are stream sinks, and you can see that they're occurring at really high densities along this geological boundary. The stream sinks are often, although not always, ephemeral. Uh, they respond very rapidly to rainfall. Um, the sink points often move, so they, they're often further downstream in wetter conditions. Sometimes they can move hundreds or even thousands of metres. And the sink points change quite a lot as well as some holes are filled up and, and others are eroded out. The flows in the stream sinks are usually small, uh, just a few litres a, a second. This picture shows a typical chalk stream sink with a flow of about two to three litres per second. I should say that there are some exceptions, and in particular, I want to highlight water end swallow holes, um, which are an enormous feature, just as big as any stream sinks we see in the Carboniferous limestone. They have an average flow of 80 litres per second and the capacity to take a thousand litres a second. So massive features. Um, but typically that's not what we see in the chalk, they're usually much more like this. There are also some stream sinks associated with the glacial till. Um, they're outlined in the black box on this map here, the, where quite a few of these have been observed. And there's also point recharge via losing rivers on outcrop chalk. We don't have a very good data set on this, but the yellow triangles on the map show some of the records that we have. There can also be um, less obvious recharge via cast in vertical solution features that don't have any surface expression. And we can see examples of these in coastal exposures, like these from the south coast. Um, some of them extend the full height of the cliff, about 95 metres in this example. And away from the cliffs, it's quite hard to know where these features are, and we don't really know how frequently they occur. But they're potentially quite important because they could enable rapid pollutant transport if a pollutant source like a septic tank or a manure pile happens to be located on or near one of these types of fissures. And there's also evidence for these types of features from tracer tests through the unsaturated zone. Um, for example, this is work by Sam Allshorn and the Leeds University team, which demonstrated rapid flow. They did some injections on the surface, but these were just at arbitrary points. They weren't injecting into a cast feature or fissure or anything. Um, and yet they still detected the tracer quite rapidly in fissures in tunnels up to 38 metres below the surface. 
There's lots of evidence for karst in the chalk saturated zone. Um, there's lots of springs. Um, you can see them shown as circles on the map here. Um, large springs are indicative of connected networks of solutional fissures and conduits. But there's little data on spring discharge. Most of the records, these are the, the small blue circles here, are springs where the flows are unknown. But there are still a few that we know to be big. Um, and these are the, the bigger blue and yellow and pink circles on the map here. I think it's likely that there's going to be many more large springs. And, and it's also likely that flows are substantially reduced since the development of, of water resources from the chalk as well. This is some um, work by Steve Worthington and Derek Ford on springs in Spain. And basically what it shows is that most springs with discharges of more than 10 litres per second are in carbonate aquifers. So this is really highlighting that, that large springs are usually indicative of solutional karstic networks. And springs can have characteristics indicative of cast. Um, so uh, some are ephemeral um, and they suddenly reactivate. This is a, a chalk spring near Lambourne in Berkshire. And the river is dry for several kilometers downstream of here when the spring's not active. And then it suddenly starts flowing again. And it can, this one actually can reach really high seasonal flows of up to 700 liters a second. But this type of spring spring migration is very typical of cast. And this is quite nicely illustrated in this conceptual figure by Andreas Hartmann. So we've got the main spring down here, which is fed by the karstic conduit network, um, but under high flow conditions um, and very wet periods, then the capacity of this conduit system is exceeded. And so the water is discharged at this overflow spring higher up. And this mechanism is also a common cause of groundwater flooding in cast aquifers and groundwater flooding is something that we do see a lot of in the chalk as well. Water quality can also be indicative of cast. Um, the picture on the left here shows uh, this spring under normal conditions with its lovely blue green colour. Um, and on the right, you can see that it's really turbid. This is about 24 hours after rainfall and the turbidity is because it's connected to stream sinks. Um, there are other water quality indicators of cast, um, for example, coliforms, which only persist for a short time in the subsurface um, and other things like rapidly degrading pesticides as well. And I learned through the knowledge exchange work that water quality indicators of, and of cast and of rapid flow are common in abstractions in the chalk, um, but with really very variable concentrations. And it does appear that at a lot of sites, the proportion of rapid flow feeding the springs and abstractions uh, may, may be quite low. But there is a uh, rapid flow quite commonly. And high transmissivity is also indicative of saturated zone cast. Um, Mike Price suggested that the unmodified fracture network in the chalk um, has a transmissivity of about 20 meters squared per day. And this map shows um, that there are actually lots and lots of boreholes which have transmissivities of more than a thousand meters squared per day. So um, a lot higher than that 20 meters squared. And it seems likely that the higher the transmissivity, the more extensive the cast networks are. This map shows the location of tracer tests that have been conducted in the chalk. Um, some of these are from observation boreholes, so OBH. Uh, these are the triangles on the maps. Um, and some of them have been tracer injections into stream sinks. These are the red and orange circles. There are a lot of gaps. So as you can see, um, over much of the chalk, no trace testing has been done. Um, but these tests have proved almost 100 individual connections. And uh, the trace tests have proved very rapid flow over um, long distances. So on this plot, the red and orange circles are the tracer tests from the stream sink. So the injection point was into a stream sink. And you can see the velocities are really rapid. 
uh, more than a thousand meters per day. And these are also tests over long distances, over a kilometer or even some of them more than 10 kilometers. And um, the triangles are where Tracer was injected into observation boreholes. And, and these are also showing rapid flows, um, mostly more than 100 metres per day and, and some more than 1,000 metres per day. There's not so much data on Tracer recoveries. Um, and these appear to be um, very variable with some very high Tracer recoveries, but quite a lot of tests um, with low recovery, suggesting high attenuation and dilution with longer residence time water. We clearly get um, stream sink to spring cast development in the chalk. There's lots of stream sinks and springs and tracer tests have shown connections between them. And I used to think that cast in the chalk was all stream sink to spring cast focused on the chalk paleogene margin and that away from this margin, the chalk wasn't really karstic. However, um, the knowledge exchange uh, data compilation has really shown that there's a lot of evidence for cast away from the margin. So here the data have been clipped so that all the points are more than five kilometers from the chalk paleogene margin. And there are lots of large springs, there are stream sinks, there's point recharge through riverbeds, there's high transmissivity, there's caves, there's rapid flow from tracer tests. And so it appears that solutional networks of conduits and fissures are occurring pretty much everywhere in the chalk. Um, so we've been thinking a bit about why this might be. One explanation is that the conduits formed in the geological past as stream sink to spring connections. This is a conceptual cross section. So you can see zone one on the right here, where runoff from the paleogene feeds into stream sinks, um, which then feeds conduit systems, which are discharged at the springs. But in the past, the paleogene would have been much more extensive. It would have extended into zone two and towards zone three. And it, it's possible that in the past, stream sink to spring connections developed in zone two and possibly even zone three. And although the stream sinks are long gone and there's now no direct connectivity to the surface, the conduit systems that they fed may still um, transport groundwater now. But we also now think that mixing dissolution may be very important in the development of cast at depth in the chalk. Um, the, the flow paths are clearly very complex with lots of potential for mixing dissolution to occur. Um, I think we're quite uncertain about how far these conduits extend, whether it's um, just tens of metres or whether they can extend hundreds or thousands of metres as well. One thing that we do know is that geology is a really important control on karstic development of permeability in the chalk. And geology is important at the surface. Um, so it determines where the low permeability material is, which results in concentrated recharge through stream sinks and the formation of dolines. So um, the paleogene sediments, the clay with flints, also areas with glacial till. And then in the subsurface, it's the geological inception horizons, which are determining the locations of the conduits. And this is true potentially for both the stream sink to spring systems, but also um, mixing dissolution conduits as well. OK, so I want to move on to the Jurassic limestones now. And for the knowledge exchange work, we've divided the aquifers into areas and we're producing reports on the evidence for cast in each of these areas. So for the Jurassic limestone, there are six areas. And I'm not going to show all of these areas, but just a few examples uh, of cast in these limestones. Um, one important point is that the geology of the Jurassic limestones is really variable. And so um, is the cast development as well. This is especially the case in terms of cave development. So in the Jurassic limestones, many areas have no caves, um, but there are two uh, very big exceptions to that. Uh, one is the Corallian limestone of Yorkshire, 
and the other is um, the Portland and Purbeck limestones um, down near the south coast. So here's an example of a cave on Portland. Um, it's quite small. Um, but there are some bigger pa passages in it by the looks of things. Um, and this cave is also quite long. It's 870 metres, the surveyed length, and it's quite complex as well, as you can see from the survey here. So these pictures and survey are from web pages by Tim Rose. Um, and these web pages are really good, lots of useful information, pictures and descriptions of caves. Um, so if you're interested in, in caves on Portland, I'd recommend going here. Um, and there are more than 30 recorded caves, um, some with great names as well, like Hopeless Hole and Kiddies Rift. But the most spectacular um, caves in the Jurassic limestone are in the Corallian limestone of Yorkshire. Uh, these are pictures of Excalibur Pot. Um, it was discovered relatively recently in 2007, and there were major extensions found in 2020, so it's now more than 3.8 kilometres long. It has some big passages in it, and in some ways seems um, very comparable to the sorts of caves we see in the Carboniferous Limestone. Um, you can find out lots more about this on the web pages of York Caving Club or the North Yorkshire Moors Caving Club. Uh, and there's also a really useful presentation by Gary Douthwaite, um, which he did in 2021, and that's on the York Caving Club YouTube channel. Um, so that's really useful. Um, and the map here is um, from another really useful article this time um, on caves and cast in the Yorkshire Corellian limestone by John Dale and Carl Thomas. Um, so in the Escalibur pot area, there are two rivers which have lots of big sink points. There's the Hutton Beck down here and the River Dove over here. And tracer testing has shown that these stream sinks are connected to a spring here called Bog Hall Spring, which is actually associated with another extensive cave called Bog Hall Cave. Okay, so this map shows the location of um, known cast caves in the Corallian limestone. Um, you can see Escalibur and Bog Hall in the Hutton and Dove catchments over here. But the main thing to point out is that other than that, the caves are mostly short. They're mostly less than 100 metres in total length. Um, but perhaps there will be other longer caves discovered here uh, in the future. I, I don't know. OK, so on this map, the red circles are stream sink locations. Um, this is quite a, a, an incomplete data set. Um, there are likely to be many more stream sinks. And in fact, in the literature, it's reported that most rivers sink as they cross the Corallian. So the Corallian the purple on this map, and you can see lots of big rivers that cross it. There's not much um, data on the flows in these stream sinks, but some of them are where there are data are clearly very big, um, hundreds of litres per second sinking into the Hutton and Dove, and also um, sinking into the um, River Derwent in the east here near Scar Scarborough. If you're not sure what hundreds of litres per second means, um, it basically means rivers, not streams. So stream sinks is probably not, not the right word here. The, these are actually um, big river sinks. There are lots of springs in the Corallian limestone. Again, we don't have very good data sets on springs and their discharges, but some of them seem to be big. Um, this is Bog Hall Cave shortly before the water emerges um, from the Bog Hall Spring on the River Dove. This map shows um, the tracer test injection points. Um, again, there's been really very little tracer testing done. Where it has been done, it's shown rapid flows of hundreds to thousands of metres per day. I'm just going to talk a little bit more about the trace testing that was done in the River Derwent over here. So this is mostly work by Aidan Foley during his PhD. And Aidan did multiple injections into the Forge Valley swallow holes on the River Derwent. 
Um, he used lots of different tracers, really very interesting work. Um, interestingly, no tracer was detected at major springs at Brompton in the west and major springs at Caton Bay in the east. But the test did show that the groundwater spreads out and the tracer was detected at lots of different outlets um, in lots of different directions. And Aidan proved connections over distances up to seven kilometres. And the median velocity was just under 400 metres per day, so um, fast. But the velocities were quite variable. And in fact, the fastest were to the Urton abstraction here, where the velocities were 13 kilometres per day. And Aidan estimated that at Urton, about 80 to 95 percent of the water is river water, so there really is a very strong connection here. Moving to the limestones of Lincolnshire, um, these limestones are quite different and in contrast to the Corallian of Yorkshire, there are no known caves in Lincolnshire. But um, there are conduits exposed in quarries um, and these are great pictures from Tim Atkinson, where um, the original conduit wall has been preserved despite the quarrying activity. And you can see the scallops, uh, the solutional features on the walls, which are indicating the past water flow. And here's another example uh, of a cast conduit with um, the conduit wall and the scallops again. And there's quite a few records of stream sinks, um, especially in the West Glen and Witham catchments. Um, this map shows the locations of, of quite a few stream sinks. Uh, a lot of them uh, sink into the Lincolnshire limestone formation, but there are some on the Great Oolite as well. And um, the picture on the left is Burton Cobble's stream sink um, near the West Glen River. And again, there's not been a lot of tracer testing done, um, but where it has been done, it's shown rapid flows. And I'm just going to look in a little bit more detail at some tests from stream sinks in the West Glen area here um, by Tim Atkinson and his students, especially Ian Booker. Picture on the, on the left there is um, a tracer injection into um, the rather spectacular Burton Coggles stream sink. Or it might be Eastern Wood, actually. I think it's Eastern Wood. Um, and the map on the right um, shows um, that the trace tests have revealed quite complicated groundwater flow pa patterns. Uh, around 16 connections have been um, proven, and the velocities were really rapid. Rapid. They varied from 100 to 10,000 metres per day. The recoveries were quite variable. So at some sites they were very low and at other sites they were quite high. Um, one of the interesting uh, things is that um, tracer injected at Burton Coggle stream sink was found at Elsthorpe in the East Glen catchment. And then tracer testing from Elsthorpe um, proved a connection to the Borno spring down here. So this is a connection from Burton Coggles over 12 kilometers, and it shows that this spring um, gets water from um, other catchment, another catchment over here. And in some of the tracer tests, there was a lot of tailing in the breakthrough curves. Here you can see um, that the tracer was detected really quickly, these peaks here. Um, but then it continued to be detected for a long period, 100 or even 200 days after injection. And this is reflecting um, attenuation mechanisms like dispersion and diffusion along these flow paths. OK, I'm just going to talk a little bit about the great and inferior oolites in, in the Cotswolds. Um, but just focusing really on, on one area and one study, which is some work that Pete Smart did in the 1970s. Um, and this is um, really important work in the area just north of the M4 between Chippenham and Bath. And Pete demonstrated 29 connections, mostly from stream sinks. I think two of them are from boreholes. Again, long distances up to five kilometers. The mean velocity from all these tests was two kilometres per day, so very rapid. Um, there was some tailing and Pete reported the 
um, the velocities based on the last arrival times. And the mean of these is 150 meters per day. So that's still quite rapid. And the mean recovery was around 43%. So this is high. Um, and what we see in this area, again, is complex cast pathways with rapid flow and, and low attenuation. So to summarize the Jurassic limestones, there's, there's lots of evidence for cast. Um, it's quite variable in terms of caves with substantial cave development in some areas and, and none in others. There hasn't been that much trace testing done, but where it has been done, it's shown very rapid flow and quite complex flow paths with convergent and divergent flow. And this picture of Easternwood stream sink um, shows the turbidity um, going into the stream sink here. And this kind of illustrates um, why springs and abstraction boreholes that are connected to stream sinks can have um, high turbidity. So um, moving to the Permian limestones, um, these used to be known as the Magnesian limestone. They're dolomitic limestones that form part of the Zechstein group. And um, we've done the least work of, on these, I think, but I'll just show you some of what we do know about cast here. These are some preliminary data um, for cast features in the Zechstein group. Um, most, if not all of these features are in the dolomitic limestones, not, not the gypsum. Um, the stream sinks are the purple triangles, uh, and these are records from the BGS cast database, and there's quite a few of these. Um, the caves are the red circles, and these are from the Natural Cavities database. Um, it's possible some of these might be landslip type caves, I, I'm not sure, but it certainly is the case that there are quite a few short cast caves. And the blue circles, the little ones, they're, they're springs, and there seem to be a lot of springs, but we don't really know anything about their discharge. I can show you a little bit more about some of these cast features. Um, so this is um, from a paper by Phil Murphy in Cave and Cast Science. Um, it's a picture of uh, the river Skell Sink. Um, it looks like a really big feature. Apparently the whole river sinks at this point. And this map is also from that paper by Murphy. Um, you can see the river Skell coming down here. And then at this point, just west of Ripon, this dashed line here, is um, shown as the underground course of the River Skell, which then apparently um, rises again somewhere here. And there's also uh, some information on stream sinks in the Permian limestones in an article by Higgins from 2018. And he provides um, these pictures, uh, which are really interesting. I mean, these stream sinks look fairly typical of the sorts of sinks that we see in cast. The bottom left one there apparently is described on Ordnance Survey maps as a whirly pit, which sounds quite good. And Higgins also reports that there's a major sinkhole that takes stormwater from the motorway. Um, and then uh, he provides this picture, which uh, looks like it is quite a a lot of drainage that can come in through here. Uh, so the caves in the Permian limestone are all short, um, a few tens of metres, maybe some a few hundred metres. Uh, as far as I know, I don't think there's active water flow, so these are, are fossil caves. Um, there do appear to be some larger sections, as shown here. Um, this is a photo by John Gunn, which is published in um, a very recent paper in Cave and Cast Science by Phil Murphy and David Lowe. Um, this paper is uh, really useful. It gives a, a review, really, of the evidence for cast in the Permian limestones. Um, some of the caves are important archaeological sites like this one. And here's another example of a Permian limestone cast cave, uh, a picture from the same article by Murphy and Lowe. So to summarize uh, about the Permian limestone, it, it's clearly karstic. There are stream sinks and caves. Um, there's no data on spring discharges, but there are lots of springs. There are some sites with transmissivities of more than a thousand meters squared today, per day, suggesting some extensive karstic networks of conduits and fissures. 
but there's been no trace of testing done as far as I know. So um, overall, there's still a lot to learn about the Permian limestones, I think. Now I want to try and make some comparisons between our four carbonate cast aquifers. And for some time, they've been considered to represent a scale of castification from the chalk through the Permian and Jurassic limestones up to the Carboniferous limestone. And this was first um, suggested by Atkinson and Smart and, and discussed further by Worthington and Ford. In terms of caves, the Carboniferous limestone is clearly very different. The caves are much bigger and much larger and much longer. Um, so in the Carboniferous limestone, there are more than 170 caves, which are more than a kilometre in length. Whereas in the Permian limestone, the Cretaceous chalk, there aren't any. And I may be proved wrong, but I think it's unlikely that any longer, any caves more than a kilometre will be found here. Considering stream sinks, um, they can occur at high densities in all four of these carbonate aquifers. There are no good data sets on flows, but I think it's reasonable to suggest that um, they're generally larger in the Carboniferous limestone. Um, and I've cheated somewhat by putting in a picture of a really big river sink here. Um, but actually, uh, you do also often get uh, much smaller stream sinks in the Carboniferous limestone that, that look rather like these other ones as well. Um, and of course, there are exceptions. Uh, as well. So in the chalk, uh, water end is obviously a massive feature and in the Jurassic limestones there are some big river sinks as well. But I think it is reasonable to say that generally uh, the stream sinks are bigger in the Carboniferous limestone. In terms of springs, I haven't yet found a picture of a large spring in the Permian limestones. Um, but as there are lots of records of springs, presumably some of them are quite big. And overall, uh, there are little data on springs, but it does seem likely that the springs are going to be bigger in the Carboniferous limestone. And it seems likely that the Carboniferous limestone springs will be flashier and with a faster and bigger response to rainfall and a higher proportion of rapid flow. And certainly in the chalk, even the springs that have connections to stream sinks seem to have high base flows. So um, comparing tracer test velocities, we don't have any data for the Permian limestones, but the velocities in the chalk and Jurassic limestones are similar to the velocities in highly karstic aquifers. In all of these cast aquifers, the velocities are several kilometres per day, and these are often tests conducted over long distances as well. We don't have a good data set on recoveries, but it does seem that trace recoveries may be generally higher in the Carboniferous limestone and lower in the chalk. Um, this is what we would expect. Um, so all, overall, there does seem to be a scale of castification. Um, so as we move up the scale of castification, uh, we see increasing amounts of cave development, increasing proportions of rapid flow, and decreasing potential for contaminant attenuation. But all of these aquifers are karstic. They all have caves, stream sinks, dolines, dry valleys, springs, and some rapid flow. And in the final part of this talk, I want to think about what the implications of this are. And I think one of the most important implications is that pollutants can travel long distances from unexpected places outside of modelled catchments. And this is a good example from the chalk of Hertfordshire. So um, here there's been lots of tracer testing from the water and stream sinks that we've discussed previously that have shown um, connections to springs and abstractions in the Lee Valley here. Over really long distances, um, these, these are more than 15 kilometres away. And there's also a bromate pollution plume that originates in Sandridge. And this plume has intersected the cast conduit system. So the bromate is present in the Lee Valley springs and boreholes. And I think that this shows that cast is really important when you're considering diffuse pollutants and also slow moving point source pollutants 
because the cast can mean that your pollutant just comes from much farther away than you would expect. So understanding cast is really important to target pollution mitigation and catchment management measures in the right places. And pollutant transport can also um, be rapid, sometimes over long distances, as we, as we have seen. Uh, and this has implications for groundwater protection. Source protection zones are the main tool used by the Environment Agency for groundwater protection. And um, all the details are outlined in their recent manual from March 2019. Um, so, uh, there are three zones. Source protection zone one, which is in red here, is the area from which water travels through the saturated zone within 50 days to reach a borehole or spring. And this has the highest level of protection. Then source protection zone two in green is the area with travel times of 50 to 300 days. And SPZ three is the total catchment. And usually SPZs are defined using groundwater modelling. But these models are very bad at representing cast, and also the rapid part of the groundwater flows through voids with extremely low effective porosity, much lower than the values which are usually used in the models. And so uh, this may be why the models can greatly underestimate um, the extent of the area from which water can reach an abstraction in less than 50 days. So because of this, the Environment Agency have a different method of delineating SBZs for cast, and this is based on conceptual understanding of the cast within the catchment, and um, the method is outlined in this 2019 manual. And this cast method has been applied to the Carboniferous Limestone. Here you can see um, the SBZ SBZs in the Mendip cast area, and the red areas are SBZ1, and these cover very big areas reflecting the large areas from which water can reach um, the springs within 50 days. And this is another example where the cast method has been applied. These are the tracer connections that were discussed before in the Corallian limestone near Scarborough. And in light of these results, the Environment Agency applied um, a cast method to SPZ delineation. And this is work that was done by Ruth Buckley and Paul Howlett of the Environment Agency. And here you can see the old SPZs um, with very small SPZ1 areas around the abstractions shown in red around here. And these are the revised SPZs. And you can see that the red areas, SPZ1, cover a really large area, reflecting the tracer testing work and including the rivers that are known to be connected to the abstractions. And although it might be thought of as difficult to regulate such areas, the Environment Agency have noted that local landowners, once the rationale was explained, really understood the need for these large areas of higher protection because of the vulnerability of the water supplies. However, um, most boreholes and springs in the Chalk and Jurassic and Permian limestones still have SPZs based on the modelling approach. And this may be partly because knowledge and evidence of cast has only been gradually emerging. And it, it also might be because it's actually quite hard to know how best to define SPZs in these types of cast aquifer, um, which don't have lots of cave development. This is an example of an area of the chalk um, around Newbury, Reading, Maidenhead. And you can see that the modelled SPZ1 areas in red are um, small and, and circular shaped um, from the modelling. And yet in this area outlined by the black box here, there are very high densities of stream sinks. Um, these are the red circles on the map. And where there are stream sinks, we know that some water travels kilometres in a few days through both the unsaturated and saturated zones. So it seems likely that the SPZs based on the models that don't take account of the cast um, are underestimating the extent of the area from which water reaches the abstractions in, in less than 50 days. There can also be rapid flow in the saturated zone in areas with no stream sinks. Uh, we did a tracer test from some monitoring boreholes to an abstraction, 
um, that demonstrated rapid flow of um, around 1.5 kilometers per day. Now, I think this example is interesting because it illustrates both the problems with the existing SPZs and the challenges of defining better SPZs in the chalk. So I'm gonna try and show um, this. So the problem is in some ways fairly obvious. Um, the trace result shows that the abstraction is supplied by water, which takes just 14 hours to travel through the whole of SPZ1, which is defined as the area with flow within 50 days. And we have no reason to think that the flow path starts at the location of the monitoring boreholes. It must continue up gradient into the catchment. So this tracer test is kind of showing that the modeled SPZs are, are not good at representing the rapid flow that, that occurs in the chalk. But it also illustrates the big challenges in trying to define SPZs in the chalk. And that is that we don't know how far these flow paths extend and we don't know where they are. And although the chalk is not as karstic as the Carboniferous Limestone, it is likely that all successful abstractions have a component of rapid flow in the saturated zone. And that rapid flow can come from far away, but we're never going to know where all the rapid flow paths are. And in many cases, we're not, not even gonna know where the main ones are. So the modeled SPZs colored here, assume that travel time increases uniformly with distance from the abstraction, 50 days from the edge of the red area here, taking progressively longer until the edge of the green area where it takes 300 days and, and so on. But in cast, some rapid flow may come from far away, shown as the thick black arrows here, while some of the flow nearer to the abstraction may be slow. And if we wanted to be sure that all areas from which water in the saturated zone reaches the abstraction in less than 50 days are in SPZ1, we'd need the whole catchment in SPZ1. And this is clearly not practical. And also not all the flow is rapid. And in fact, we suspect that a lot of the flow has a much longer residence time with much more dilution of the rapid flow components than we see in classic casts like the Carboniferous Limestone. So, it's quite difficult to know what the best approach is, but it does seem that some sort of cast type approach to SPZ delineation may be useful at many sites in the chalk and Jurassic and Permian limestones. Okay, so um, let's try and draw this all together into some conclusions and think about what we've learned about cast. There's lots of evidence for cast in these carbonate aquifers. And to some extent, I focused a lot on the more obvious evidence like the stream sinks and the caves and the trace tests, which show rapid flow over long distances. Hopefully this has convinced you that these really are cast aquifers. I would say that the prevalence of these has been quite a surprise to me. I never expected there to be quite so much of this type of evidence for cast in these aquifers. I think a very important point is that cast is not just about caves, it's also about networks of smaller conduits and solutional fissures. And their formation is governed by the same processes um, that govern caves. And so if we want to understand permeability in these aquifers, then I think understanding the cast processes is helpful. And probably considering cast in these aquifers um, could help with all aspects of hydrogeology. It could help with understanding recharge, um, with catchment management through better understanding of pollutant sources and better catchment delineation. It could help with understanding pollutant transport and attenuation and groundwater protection. It could help with understanding groundwater flooding. It's also uh, important for ensuring sustainable development of water resources because it's the karstic nature of these aquifers, which determines where abstractions impact springs and groundwater fed rivers. Um, and there are lots of remaining challenges and uncertainties. I think we need um, better cast data sets um, on spring discharges, stream sinks, trace deaths, conduits. Um, I think there's still a lot to learn about the proportions of rapid recharge and the proportions of rapid flow. 
and a lot to learn about the locations and extent of the solutional networks. Um, but maybe as we continue to develop a better understanding of cast, that will help us to protect the water resources that we rely on, but also to protect the environment that also relies so much on groundwater to sustain the river flows and, and to sustain the ecosystems. Um, and I think I'm going to stop there um, and just say thank you for listening. And, and once again, thank you very much to everyone who has contributed to this. Um, OK, I'm going to stop. How do I stop? That, that's all right, Lou. You can you can keep your slide up. It's a very pretty picture. Clark, <laughs> just short screen. Um, and, and thank you very much, Lou. That was very, very interesting, um, especially as how widespread castiness, be it very casty or not so casty, but still very interestingly cast, uh, is across across England, which is very fascinating. Um, if anybody has any questions, and I'm sure some people do, because we've got a good audience today. I think we I think we got to 70 at one point, Lou. It's very, very good. <laughs> Um, could you put them in the chat box and uh, we, we can address them? Um, Lou, I, I had a, a quick question. Um, you were mentioning a few times in your talk about how certain things surprised you as you were going through, which in itself is quite surprising how long you've been working with CAST for. What was the, the most surprising thing that you discovered during sort of knowledge exchange? Um, I think it was how frequently the stream sinks occur in the aquifers. I, I didn't think there would be quite as many stream sinks as there are. Uh, and just really how widespread it was. I, I, I suppose when I set out on it, I was thinking that there was gonna be evidence of cast in some areas. And what we'd end up with is showing that in some areas there's a localized cast and in other areas, um, there isn't really much evidence of cast. So it, it was quite surprising to find that it was much more widespread than I expected. I think especially that aspect of it being quite far into the chalk as well, when you're not looking at those sort of contacts between the palladium. Oh. Well, I think that's that in itself is quite fascinating as well. Uh, we've got some, some good questions coming up now. Um, we've got one, the first one in the chat box is from Miguel. He said there is widespread use of tracer tests to investigate cast conduits in ground studies aiming at water resources or pollution. What other tools are there to map cast conduit networks? Is geophysics useful? Hmm. Gosh, lots of questions in there. So um, <laughs> I don't know a huge about, amount about geophysics, but my understanding is that um, that the, the sensitivity of the geophysics isn't really good enough to enable us to identify these smaller networks of fissures and conduits in the subsurface. And, and in fact, as far as I understand, apart from possibly um, very shallow cavities, which I think they are quite good for, uh, I'm, I'm not sure that even the big cave systems are, are that well shown um, using geophysics, especially when those cave systems are at depth. Um, but I mean, there are other tools that we can use. So, I mean, one thing that I always find quite interesting is that the borehole images um, that can be used. So there are cameras that can be lowered down boreholes. And so we can see the sorts of voids that are supplying those boreholes. And, and that is you know, where some of our evidence for, for these smaller conduits has come from. And I think, uh, I think that's quite useful. And, and we can also then look at um, tying that in with the stratigraphy so we can see what the geological controls are on those conduits and that will then help us to hypothesize you know how far they might extend um, along those sorts of horizons um, but it is very difficult I, I think um, other than with tracer testing to to know where these pathways are I, I think it's one of the the big challenges yeah, it's essentially trying to gather as much extra data as possible isn't it start developing even more understanding which is brilliant um i think other questions we've got we've got one from ben ball it says is there forward modeling for climate change for sbz and flows sorry can you say that again it says is there forward modeling for climate change for sbz and flows i don't know the answer to that <laughs> um 
I, I don't know either, speaking from the environment agency point of view. No. <laughs> Look no, after us, these heads. It's something we can certainly think about, I'm sure, in both organisations. No, I mean, there's clearly questions about, you know, how climate change might impact on groundwater. And I know there's lots of groundwater science that is going on to try and look at those sorts of questions and looking, you know, at how aquifers may respond if we have increased droughts or increased flooding. And, and obviously, I think understanding the cast is potentially quite important for that, because for groundwater flooding, I think, um, when you have the capacity of the conduit systems exceeded and that in, that causes groundwater flooding, I think that can help us understand where it's likely to happen. And, and I think in terms of droughts, understanding cast is potentially also important because if you've got a spring or an abstraction which has a very high proportion of rapid flow, then it's going to be much more sensitive to um, drought periods, whereas if you've got a much higher base flow and much less rapid flow, so it's sort of less classically plastic, then you're going to have a bit more resilience to drought. Um, but I don't know of any work specifically on, on the SPZs in, in this regard. Um, oh, I just had the other question up in the small chat that moved it down. Um, Mike Jones had a, a quick question about the cast report series. He's put a link in the chat to the BGS website uh, in terms of the cast act for cast report series. And he's asking, um, is that the best place to check out collated information? And if so, will there be a report of each of those geographical areas you had on your map? Yes, no, that's right. And there will be, I think at the moment on the BGS web pages, there are four or five of the reports which are up and available for some of the areas uh, and the others will be coming out hopefully over the coming year or so. Um, but yes, that's going to be the main place where all the information from the knowledge exchange work is going to be coming out. Excellent. So the, the link is there for everyone in the Zoom yeah. to go check it out, which yeah, is great. Yeah, also, actually, if you're interested in the chalk, um, there are quite a few papers that have recently come out in the Geological Society special publication on the chalk, which relate to cast. So um, there's papers led by Steve Worthington, by Aidan Foley, by Andy Farron and myself, um, which all have quite a lot of information on cast in the chalk in England. So um, there's a lot of information there. I think that's something I noted down already in terms of the special publication number that have been on your slides. <laughs> so, yes, better remind myself about that. Um, we have a, another question from Rod Smith. He says there seem to be some interesting both divergent and convergent tracer test patterns in different areas, which would indicate different development with chalk. Is there a pattern of convergent to divergent away from the paleogen outcrop? I don't think we know the answer to that. Um, so, I mean, most of the, the information that we have on pathways has come from stream sync tracer tests, because this is where areas have been most comprehensively studied with tracer testing. And then, yes, as, as he notes, and as we saw in the slides, that the flow paths do seem to be complex. So we have multiple injection points all going to the same place, but also diverging and going to different places. And, and that does seem to be a characteristic of cast aquifers in general, but particularly in these kinds of casts, I think. Excellent. Uh, there's, a, there's a few more keeping on popping up into the chat if you're happy to take them, Lou. Yes. Um, I don't want to keep you for too long. <laughs> yeah, it's great. It's amazing that so many people have come and people are really interested in it. Yeah, the next question is from Mark Wheeler. He asks, is there evidence for increased presence of cast below head deposits in dry valleys in relation to cast in the chalk? So the dry valley question is a good one. Um, generally, it's been pretty well established that we see high, higher transmissivity um, below valleys than below interfluve areas in the chalk. Um, so it may well be that we do get um, more solutional development beneath river valleys. That's certainly something that's been discussed and also beneath the dry valleys as well. Um, and there are a number of reasons why you might get solutional development beneath dry valleys. Um, it could be that they once had um, water flow and there were sink points developed which are no longer there. Um, it could be 
that there were um, springs that were active, but now that the water level has dropped below that level, so it's now dry. But then I think it is also the case that it's pretty well established that um, periglacial processes are thought to be um, responsible for a lot of the, the dry valley networks that we see in the chalk. So I think, I think there's still a bit to learn about dry valleys. Um, I, think we're, I think we're down to three left, three left. <laughs> we have one from Ian Pigram who says, do any old borehole abstraction test data that we consider odd make more sense with our cast hat on? I don't know the answer to this as well as I should, but I think that they do. I think that people who have looked a lot more at pump test data than I have, that there are particular patterns that you are more likely to observe um, in pump test data where you've got Karstic type flows occurring. Um, and I'm sure there are papers on this, but I, I, I'd have to look them up. Sounds like a little research project just waiting to happen there. <laughs> uh, and then we have our next question is from Hobby Orif. Do we know anything about conduits in the chalk beneath the paleogene? So, uh, uh, yes, we do know a bit. So, um, I probably might give the example of the Bedhampton Haven Springs, which occur um, in the South Downs. And so um, they're fed by, they've been shown by tracer tests to be fed by stream sinks that occur on the chalk paleogene boundary, but the conduits actually go all the way underneath the very thick paleogene deposits to then come out at the springs um, and further to the south. And so, um, so yes, in some cases you can get conduit development beneath the paleogene. However, in other areas um, like the London Basin, I think um, there's much less evidence for, for higher permeability where you've got a very thick paleogene cover. So I think it, it's quite variable and depends on the particular geological setting probably. Um, and I think the the next one, I'm not quite sure it's a question, more of a, a discussion point, I think. It's from Colin Warren. He says, having worked on chalk, have noticed cast an upper chalk and associated with Glyn Mard to the top of the new pit chalk, and also open discon discontinuities in the Hollywell chalk, believe useful to include transmissivity and discontinuity type and frequency in studies on cast occurrence within the chalk. You know, another person to talk to here is Andy Farrant, who I think has, he's a, a geologist at BGS who has a, a really good handle on the kind of geological controls on cast and which particular horizons within the chalk stratigraphy are, are more likely um, to be karstic and, and have these sorts of flows in them. So I think that sort of approach is definitely really useful. And I think, uh, I think this is gonna be our last question. Uh, is from Mike Jones. He says, there's a perspective from locals around Sirencester that there are stream sinks that influence low flows in streams. Has this type of anecdotal information, information been of use in the cast knowledge exchange work? Yes, absolutely. And I'm, I'm trying to think whether I know about these stream sinks near Sirencester, and I'm not sure if they're on our on our records or not, but I might be in touch afterwards, Mike, to, to find out. But yes, absolutely, because, um, you know, the only way we know about these features is, is where people tell us about them. And I mean, obviously, for the knowledge exchange work, we haven't been able to go out and visit all the features. And so, you know, the, in a way, it's a basis for, for future work. And if they haven't been verified in the field, we don't know for certain whether they're cast features, but definitely the starting point is where people can tell us that they know of these types of features so yeah I'd be really interested in those. I'm sure Mike can supply them should be good. Um, I think that's the, the last of the questions Lou the, the, the grilling has finished. <laughs> uh, I think all, all that's left for me to say is say thank you very much for coming to talk to us I think we've, we've all found it very interesting and uh, having all those questions also shows how interested other people have been in it. Um, for those that uh, are still on the line, would you mind unmuting your mics and just having a little clap and to say thank you very much, Lou?
this sometimes works, this sometimes doesn't. There we go. So thank you very much, Lou. Um, I think the only thing I'm going to quickly share my screen and just bring up the details for the next um, next meeting that we've got coming up next month. Um, so next month on the 15th of June, um, we are hoping for Professor Daniel R. Parsons from Hull University to come talk to us about something that was in the BBC News last summer. Uh, which was a two-day underwater avalanche off the coast of West Africa. And this was only detected because it completely annihilated all the cabling that was down there. And it was it sounded very, very impressive. And there's an article on the BBC News website if you want to have a look. But that will be, the details for that will be emailed out on the TVRG email list uh, for the event very soon, I hope. <laughs> and that is it. So thank you very much, everyone. And thank you again, Lou. And with that, I will close the meeting and hopefully see some of you next month. Thanks once again. Bye. Bye. Thank you.